in a secret hideout, they took a solemn oath. So stand up like men and drive the enemy into the sea. Their enemy, the government of the United States. I was tried for conspiring to seditiously overthrow the United States government, and that is one of the proudest moments of my life. Tonight, you'll hear from the men who may have set the example for the deadly bombing in Oklahoma City. The Oklahoma bombing didn't surprise me. People seem so shocked that it was domestic terrorism. I don't know why. That's what we did. What this group did was rob and kill in the name of revolution. We were all assigned someone to, to kill. Who, who did you get? Their leaders had a hit list and a plan to blow up power lines, poison water supplies, and sabotage the Los Angeles Olympics. This was undoubtedly the most organized group of terrorists that ever operated in the United States. How did these once law-abiding men turn into terrorists? I couldn't get out. There was no way out. There was no way out of it. Turning Point, tonight, Inside the Hate Conspiracy, America's Terrorists. Good evening, I'm Forrest Sawyer. When Timothy McVeigh went on trial earlier this year, the prosecution relied heavily on evidence that showed his anti-government sentiments. He studied and appears to have used as a blueprint for the Oklahoma City bombing an extremist book called The Turner Diaries. And he reportedly analyzed the activities of a white separatist group operating in the 1980s called The Order. Tonight, Chief Correspondent Meredith Vieira goes inside the order, a group of made-in-America terrorists who planned to bring down the entire government. When we first broadcast this report, just months after McVeigh's arrest, many of the members of the order talked to us publicly for the first time. Some of the men you'll meet tonight are in disguise. They still fear for their lives. The wilderness of the Northwest has long been a haven for loners, pioneers, and mavericks. In the autumn of 1983, a group of young men took that spirit of independence and turned it into terrorism. The fact is, the suspects in two pickup trucks shot out the windows and the tires of the armored cars. These things happen and are not considered crimes or considered acts of war. Portland police SWAT teams were beginning a major search for the runaway I think we all justify it to ourselves in different ways, and we told ourselves it was for a greater good. It involved the murder of a Jewish radio talk show host in Denver. We were all willing to give up our lives. Give up your lives for what? For our race. In the name of the white race, these men, most of whom had never been in trouble with the law, became the most wanted criminals in America part of a group that robbed millions of dollars and killed to silence their enemies. This was undoubtedly the most organized group of terrorist type people to have ever operated in the United States. They would become known as the Order and launch what they call the Second American Revolution. At the time of their arrest, some members were making plans to bomb public utilities, poison the water supplies of major cities, and sabotaged the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. Most of these men have never told their story before, never explained why they took up arms against their own government. How does anyone become a terrorist? For the order, it began with nine men, a secret ceremony, and a solemn oath. The gist of it was that we were starting a, an order here. To do what? Basically, uh, to bring down the government, to start chaos to disrupt the system in the best way we could. You absolutely believe? We absolutely believed it. There was no question in our mind that uh, we could do it. This is the man who inspired that belief, the man who brought the order together, Bob Matthews. The fate of every last white Man, woman, and child on this planet lies squarely on the shoulders of us. We cannot fail. 30-year-old Bob Matthews was a blue-collar worker and farmer in Medellin Falls, Washington. A hard-working family man with a baby face, which may have made what came out of his mouth 
seem acceptable. If you have not yet fully committed yourself, then you have in effect not only betrayed your race, you have betrayed yourself. Matthews had been toying with extreme views since childhood. At age 11, he stunned his middle-class parents by joining the anti-communist John Birch Society. From there, he sampled one radical group after another, gradually becoming convinced there was a conspiracy to destroy the white race. Bob Matthews decided he wanted to do something about it. Hail his victory! This is where Matthews would eventually recruit the most fanatic members of the order, Aryan Nations, a gathering place in Idaho for right-wing extremists. One of them was Bruce Pierce, an unemployed laborer seen in this video taken by an infiltrator in 1983. We felt that a, an ordinary amount of Jews were in key positions, media, finance, government, and they posed a threat to our continued existence if their policies continued. The resurrection of swastika. Leaders at Aryan Nations preached a doctrine called identity, which claimed Jews were the spawn of Satan, and therefore the mortal enemies of the chosen people of God, white Christians. One, God, one nation, one race, one God. This identity doctrine gave me a, a view of the, of the Bible that said, wow, this... This is it. This is the reason things are going wrong. For Denver Parmenter, a hard-drinking Army veteran who worked as a guard at Aryan Nations, anti-Semitism was a crusade. Blacks uh, were just another issue used by the Jews to mingle or, and dilute the white race. Just take them back to Africa and, you know, let them live their lives, we'll live ours. But uh, the Jews were, that's another matter. The Jews had to be killed. They had to be killed, yes. Parmenter would prove to be a perfect recruit for Bob Matthews. Individuals who are inspired by the warped views of a Robert Matthews who are willing to uh, lay it all on the line because most of them have nothing to lose. Civil rights attorney Morris Dees has made a name for himself squaring off in court against leaders of the radical the right. Responsible for enforcing the Over the years, he's seen the movement begin to tap into the mainstream. A lot of people who had never had been any Semitic or racist in their lives joined in with Robert Matthews. Two years before, if you'd asked him, would they have been involved in such a thing, that they would have said no, and the friends around them would have said, I wouldn't have believed this individual would have ever done this. In the early 80s, Dees formed an organization to monitor the growing number of hate groups. But back then, Dees wasn't aware of Bob Matthews or his powers of persuasion over people like the man we'll call Tony Walsh. He knew how to manipulate me, I guess. He knew what buttons he could push on me. Walsh and his wife had moved to Washington State to escape the big city problems of Los Angeles. Matthews became his best friend and slowly played on the frustrations that had driven him there. What was his dream? To have a, an area of America that was just for white people. Because he felt, you know, the white man made this country. And they, they you know... They don't have a country anymore, he felt, anyway. Did you think it was a good idea? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was all right. So did Richard Kemp, a high school basketball star who'd recently dropped out of college and left home. Matthews took him in and got him a job at the local dam. He was like the older brother I never had. Looking back, I'd say that he was my mentor. Kemp says when he lost his job, Matthews blamed it on affirmative action and said it proved his point. He was mad and blustered about losing the job because you're a white man and it's a definite attack on you because you're a white male. <laughs> Before long, Kemp and Walsh were going with Matthews to Aryan Nations, whose members spent time taking pot shots at pictures of Jews like Israel's Prime Minister, Menachem Begin. They burned crosses, too. But by the summer of 1983, Matthews was getting tired of the symbolic cross burnings, tired of the play acting. He was one of the impatient ones. But I think we were all getting impatient. We were all getting impatient with it. We were tired of the talk. Let's, let's do something. Events in America's heartland would help Matthews convince them to take action. I'm not 
believe in the land. And I'm not giving up possession of the land. The country was in a recession, and with every foreclosure, farmers saw their way of life disappearing. They blamed the politicians and bankers for selling them out. Farmers who believed in a government conspiracy were talking of fighting back. One of them, Gordon Call, traveled the countryside promoting tax revolt and armed resistance. Gordon Call would soon become a martyr for the extreme right wing and a hero to Bob Matthews. Got two station wagons coming at you. The confrontation began in North Dakota when U.S. Marshals came to arrest Call for violating his probation on a tax conviction. Two marshals were killed. Call escaped, only to be hunted down in Arkansas by the FBI four months later. He and a sheriff were shot and killed as Call's hideout went up in flames. Call's death would galvanize the extreme right and drive Bob Matthews that much closer to action. Uh, we're remembered of the words of Jesus Christ. Three weeks later, at an Aryan Nations rally in Spokane, Washington, Matthews stepped forward when counter demonstrators tried to disrupt the speeches. Get the heck out of here! I didn't come all the way down here to hear you! Go over there! Go across the barricade and let us be! Before I even realized what happened, I was right by his side with the other man. I felt like I took a stand for the first time myself. When it was over, it's like, damn, I stood by him. Bob Matthews had emerged as a leader. What do you think it was about Bob that day that impressed them? That he stood up. He stood up to the enemy. Very few white people do things like that, you know? If Matthews inspired them, much of his inspiration came from an incendiary novel called The Turner Diaries, which describes the violent overthrow of the U.S. government to establish a whites-only homeland. That book became Matthews' Bible. He memorized every word. In September, the author of The Turner Diaries had Matthews speak to his neo-Nazi organization in Virginia. The signs of awakening are sprouting up across the Northwest and no more so than amongst the two-fisted farmers and ranchers, a class of our people who have been hit especially hard by the filthy, lying Jews and their parasitical usury system. Bob Matthews was ready to launch his revolution. So kinsman, duty calls. The future is now. So stand up like men and drive the enemy into the sea. Next thing I know, we're, we're having a meeting in the barracks. Uh, there's eight or nine of us together forming the order. In late September, Matthews brought Denver Parmenter and seven others to a barracks he'd built on his property and told them what they needed to do to save the white race. I think we probably all agreed that, wow, we've arrived here at a decision. Now let's talk about what our first step will be. Using the Turner Diaries as a blueprint, Matthews outlined his plan to turn the men into a force of elite commandos. They would operate underground, just like the group called the Order in the book. Their first mission was to raise a war chest for the extreme right, if not legally, then through counterfeiting and robbery. And then uh, I said, well, guys, if you gotta, if you gotta rob, let's, let's get rid of the evil. Let's, uh, let's rob these drug dealers or uh, the porno bookstores and stuff like that, you know? And what were they gonna do with the money once they got the money? send it out to these uh, organizations like Aryan Nation so they could expand. The men also debated whether or not to begin executing Jews and so-called race traitors, just like in the Turner Diaries. We were all assigned someone to, to kill. Who, who did you get? Some major network president. Um, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, I, I don't remember. If the group got broken up, um, you know, that was our target, to go out and get this guy. You, who had never focused a gun on anybody when they said, and this is the person you're going to kill, that was okay? Mm -hmm. We were Aryan warriors. This was war. Civil rights attorney Morris Dees was Bob Matthews' number one target. I'm not Jewish and certainly not Antichrist, but that's how I was labeled. We thought he was, at least at the time, I never questioned the fact that someone said he was a Jew, he was a Jew. So he was an enemy of ours. When the planning was over, Matthews asked the men to stand, and an infant was placed in the middle of the circle. 
my baby. Bob asked me to have her there, so. Uh, why would he want her there? That was our race right there. That was our, our future. That's why we were doing this. With Tony Walsh's four-week-old daughter looking up at them, Matthews had his new recruits repeat an oath. Swear a sacred oath upon the green graves of our sires. His words of revolution would now become theirs. From this moment on, I have no fear of death, no fear of foe, that I have a sacred duty to do whatever is necessary to deliver our people from the Jew and bring total victory to the Aryan race. I was I, as an Aryan admitting people, to them or pledging myself to them almost like a marriage vow that, that I'm going to ride with them to the end. We hereby invoke the blood covenant and declare that we are in a full state of war. So stand up like men and drive the and enemy not into the sea. Lay down our weapons until we have driven the enemy into the sea. When you stood in that circle, what were you saying? I just kept looking at my daughter, I guess. I'm justifying this, I guess. Within a few months, Tony Walsh would no longer be able to justify anything. I really didn't want anybody to die. I didn't want it to go this far. I really didn't want it to go that far. It would go much farther than Tony Walsh ever anticipated when we return. The order launches its revolution, and the killing begins. Inside the hate conspiracy, America's terrorists. Tonight's turning point. But now, Meredith Vieira reports how a disorganized band of men with little or no criminal experience launched a crime wave. The order's revolution began on October 28, 1983, in this CD section of Spokane, Washington a place they felt represented everything wrong with America. Bob Matthews and three recruits held up this porn shop and made off with $369. For Bruce Pierce, it was an important first step. No, we didn't get much money, but it's better to start small and work your way up. If we can't take this first little step, then we might as well unpack our bags and go back home. But their revolution was barely off the ground when it suddenly came to a halt. Using the presses at Aryan Nations, the group had begun printing counterfeit money. When Bruce Pierce tried to pass the poorly forged bills, he was arrested. Matthew saw his dream falling apart as members started to drift away. I never saw Bob like that before. He was upset, real pale. He said, uh, oh, what's the matter, Bob? I said, I got to do something. Bruce is still in prison, and I got to get him out. I'm letting, letting everybody down. I'm letting everybody down. He took off with a gun. We didn't see him again for three months. And he's talking about robbing a bank. For one, I didn't think he'd follow through because he was scared to death. Just before Christmas 1983, Bob Matthews followed through. All alone and armed, he walked into this bank north of Seattle and left with nearly $26,000, which he stashed in a child's trick-or-treat bag. Bob Matthews had good reason to smile again. He comes back. He's euphoric, were euphoric. The people that drifted away, now they're back again. He made it look so easy. By then, Bob Matthews had recruited Gary Yarborough, a security guard at Aryan Nations who was also a convicted felon. He helped the order perfect its criminal technique, and the results were soon apparent. In March 1984, order members rob an armored car at a shopping mall in Seattle. The take is $43,000. April, a bomb is set off in a different part of town to divert police, so the order can hold up another armored car. It's Richard Kemp's first robbery. Well, they already got it planned. They got away with all these other ones. I'm going to get away with it, too. At first, that's what I thought. Then I thought, I could die doing this. I guess that this is going to prove myself once and for all that I'm down for Bob, and then I'll help him do anything. All I do is just jump out, and wave a gun around, next thing I know, we're gone. Gone with $230,000 cash. There are no suspects and few clues. Bob Matthews begins fulfilling his promise to help bankroll the extreme right. I felt almost like a, like a Robin Hood type thing because I knew most of the money that we stole was being given away. 
I would go around the country and uh, meet with these people and, you know, give them a few thousand and say there's more if, if uh, I like the way your movement is going and if it's going in the right direction or not. They say money gives you power. Well, I think the money gave him power, thinking that he was invincible because things were happening and he was getting away with it. With money, the order moved deeper underground. Most of the members who still held jobs quit them. They bought automatic weapons and were given security code names and false identities. Matthews brought in more recruits, including a professional counterfeiter and a street smart racist from the East Coast named Tom Martinez. And he came to a, to a guy like me in a big city and a good place to laundry, a street kid. He'll know how to laundry the money more than these farm boys he was hanging around with. And that's exactly what he did. He used me. Appeal to your greed? For sure. We all have a little greed in us, and at that point, I had a lot of greed that day. But when Martinez visited Matthews in Washington State, he knew laundering money was as far as he wanted to go. Matthews asked him to move out west permanently. He said no. No, there was something telling me not to move out there because I, th I was afraid of what was going to be asked of me next and uh, the way things were going. I know it was going to come to murder. In May 1984, it did come to murder. Ironically, their first victim was one of their own, Walter West, a member of Aryan Nations whom Bob Matthews suspected of talking too much. Matthews asked four of his men to carry out West's execution. Among them, according to Tony Walsh, were Randy Dewey and Richard Kemp. They, they lured him into the woods and they... Rich tried to kill him with a hammer. And he didn't kill him, though. That's when Randy... Randy put him out of his misery. He shot him, you know, to finish him off. Randy Dewey declined our request for an interview. Richard Kemp has never talked publicly about the murder. I just wonder if you acknowledge what this group did that you were a part of. That was the first time that this turned into more than just waving a gun and running off with some money. And it wasn't a euphoric moment anymore. Something else was happening the moment Walter West died. You can't talk about it. Can't talk about it. How did you find out that Walter West had been murdered? Uh, Rich told me. Kemp? Yeah. Because he told me what happened, you know. And he did it for Bob. That young kid did it for Bob. The body of Walter West was never found. A week later, according to several order members, Bob Matthews and a few of the men met secretly to plan other assassinations. They discussed killing Morris Dees, the civil rights lawyer who had come to the order's attention for monitoring the radical right. And they argued about whether it was time to begin carrying out their oath to rid the world of Jews. Uh, you apparently feel that the Jews are part of a communist conspiracy, is that correct? Well, as I went into the study of communism, I came When this up, exchange uh, was broadcast from the studios of KOA in Denver, the order was listening. The program was run by liberal talk show host Alan Berg. This night, Berg was tangling with a leader of the extreme right, Jack Moore from Mississippi. Uh, I have been on programs like this many, many times before, and I've run into fellows like you that interrupt and try to stop. Now, Jack, you have barely been interrupted so far, Jack, so don't give me that, don't give me that garbage. You haven't been interrupted at all, man. Berg's combative style had brought him national attention and fame. More than anything, Berg, who was Jewish, hated anti-Semitism, and he went after those who preached it. Hey, Jack, go ahead. Both of you hang up, cowards. This February broadcast was typical. It may also have made Berg a marked man. David Lane, a member of the order old enough to have rooted for Hitler in World War II, was listening to Berg that night and phoned in. I think the Jews are still firmly in control of the Soviet Union. I think they're responsible for the murder of 15 million white Christians. You think so, huh? Yes, I do. I think, I think you're sick. I think you're pathetic. I think your ability to reason and use any logic is a tragedy. Why don't you put a Nazi on your program and then you have somebody... Can... Sir, you are a Nazi by your very own admission. Thanks so much. If he said that's right, you heard it. 
The order would not forget this confrontation. In June, David Lane and Bruce Pierce were reportedly part of a hit team assembled by Bob Matthews, who led them south to Denver to assassinate Alan Berg. It was just after 9 p.m. on June 18th when Alan Berg's VW Beetle made the turn off Colfax and headed up the street to his driveway. They watched as the VW passed by and pulled out after him. As Berg made the turn up his short driveway to his garage door, the other car blocked the road behind him. Instantly, 13 45 caliber slugs burst from the automatic weapon. A silencer muffled the blast, and Berg was probably dead before he hit the ground. I can remember the crime scene, uh, the victim's body here in the driveway, you know, the massive destruction. We didn't have eyewitnesses. Uh, the only evidence that we had were shell casings and bullets. You know, it was clear early on, immediately, that this was uh, an assassination, a, a hit, an ambush. Police in Denver say they have no firm leads yet. The order's her. crimes were now making national news, but no one knew who was committing them. I'm going to talk to you this sunny Colorado morning about a friend I once had, and his name was Alan Byrd. The next morning in Denver, another KOA radio talk host, Ken Hamblin, eulogized his friend and challenged Berg's killers. And I found myself speaking to them. I found myself saying, you can't kill ideas. You can't kill words. You can only kill the man. Who are you? Who are you people? You reached out with all of that power to kill him? No. You didn't show strength, sir. You didn't show strength. That morning, Matthews and his hit team were already on their way north out of Colorado. Some order members say Bruce Pierce was the trigger man. Were you there when Alan Berg was killed? I have no comment. I'm sorry. He talked about it? Oh, yeah. Proud of it? Proud of it. He was bragging about how the gun jammed on the 13th bullet and how uh, 13 means something, you know. Back in the Northwest, some order members were shocked at the news of the murder. Most were not. Was Berg even, in your mind, a person? He was a Jew, and therefore worthy of death, in my mind, at that time. End of story. End of story. For Bob Matthews and his recruits in the Northwest, there would be no turning back. That July, near Lake Mendocino in Northern California, in broad daylight, Matthews and 11 others lay in wait with automatic weapons. They'd been tipped off by a new member of the order who worked at Brinks. As an armored car labored slowly up this hill, they surrounded it with pickup trucks and flashed a threatening sign. It was Brinks guard Aaron Davis's first week on the job. I said, well, they're slowing down. I said, we have to go around them. And that's when that sign went up, get out or die. I said, well, it must be a joke until they stood up and stopped firing. The armor-piercing shells passed easily through the bulletproof windshield. You think you're going to die? And, you know, hope it's over if you die, die quickly. We just formed a line from the, from the door of the truck to the pickup, and we just passed it. Matthews was in the vehicle, and, and I was in one of the lines. Bags of money? Bags of money. The pickups were abandoned a mile away, and all 12 order members escaped with $3.6 million dollars at the time, the largest armored car heist in U.S. history. Never in my career had I seen uh, anything to compare to this. FBI case agent Wayne Manis would spearhead the nationwide investigation into the order. They had sophisticated weaponry, plenty of ammunition. Uh, their equipment, I would say, was certainly as good as that being used by the FBI at the time. But now the FBI had a solid lead. Bob Matthews had dropped a traceable gun in the back of the Brinks truck. The hunt was on and would eventually lead investigators to assassination target Morris Dees. I never will forget uh, this agent uh, who identified himself and said that, uh, that to let me know that that was a uh, serious threat against my life from uh, a white supremacy group. Did he name the group? No, but it but doesn't mean that I'm going to, you know, back off on what I'm doing because you've got some nut out there that wants to shoot you in the back. It was just a war 
to them. It was a war to us. We were every bit as committed to the task as they were. Back in the Northwest, order members argued with Bob Matthews that it was time to lay low. Matthews would have none of it. He wouldn't slow down. He wouldn't slow down one bit. Bob couldn't wait. Bob had to keep going. Go, 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 go. Matthews made plans for a paramilitary camp deep in the woods to train an army of believers. They would take his revolution to the next level. One of the plans was to blow up or carry, have him get to Olympics. If innocent people had to die, then uh, for the cause, then again, that was just a means to justify the end. Bob Matthews knew the authorities were closing in, but he was so busy looking for the enemy behind every tree, he missed the traitor standing right next to him. Inside the hate conspiracy, America's terrorists. Tonight's turning point will continue in a moment. Conspiracy, America's terrorists. When we come back, the order escalates its plan to overthrow the U.S. government. But the FBI and Bob Matthews are about to come face to face. I've been involved in gun battles before during my tenure in the FBI, but never anything like this. Turning Point will continue after this from our ABC stations. Conspiracy, America's terrorists. Tonight's Turning Point continues once again, Forrest Sawyer. Now the incredible story of how the FBI was able to track down and infiltrate this band of homegrown terrorists. It began with the arrest of Tom Martinez, the man who had helped the order launder counterfeit money. Martinez agreed to cooperate. He told them the order was responsible for the Brinks robbery and the murder of Alan Berg. And as Meredith Vieira reports, he agreed to take them to the order's leader, Bob Matthews. Friday, November 23rd, 1984. The beginning of the end for Bob Matthews. Tom Martinez flies into Portland, Oregon. Having told Matthews, he's willing to talk about going underground with the order. What Matthews doesn't know is that Martinez has made a deal with the FBI. I said, I can take you to Bob Matthews. And they were like in shock. I said, under two conditions. You don't reveal me, and no one gets hurt, and you got to promise that. Matthews meets the plane, but seems nervous. And he's brought along order member and ex-convict Gary Yarborough. We took off going about 80 miles an hour in the streets of Portland. And as I glanced behind me, the fellow behind me, Yarborough, has a machine gun in his hands. Matthew suspects he's being followed and turns down a dead-end street. Martinez panics, afraid of what will happen if agents tailing them show up. And when we pulled into this wooded area, my heart just started throbbing, thinking, what are these guys planning on doing? Are they going to kill me? Do they know I'm working for the feds? Luckily for Martinez, the FBI has lost his trail. But now he has no protection as Matthews drives to a nearby motel. And no choice but to go along when Matthews takes him upstairs and gives Martinez his new assignment. He wasn't asking me. He was telling me now, you're going to be part of a cell to kidnap and murder Mars Dees. And he said, we're going to torture him. And he said, we're going to torture him. We're going to find out information from Dees. We would murder him, bury him, and throw lie in the ground. Well, that's kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of uh, chilling. And did you have any doubt in your mind that he meant it? As well, he definitely meant it. That's when it just clicked to me that he's crazier than crazy. I could see it in his eyes. Martinez makes an excuse to leave, then slips out to a nearby restaurant. Much to his relief, the FBI finds him. He tells them about the plot to murder Morris Dees, and then returns to his room, number 14. At dawn, Tom Martinez gets a call. It's the FBI. It's going down now, the agent tells him. Don't come out of your room. And uh, I went over to the peak hole, and I could see Bob come out on the balcony. I never in my life was so scared. I heard a shot fired. I heard voices yelling. And I heard running, like thumping sounds and running. It's Bob Matthews racing from the motel. In the gunfire, an FBI agent and the motel manager are wounded, and Matthews himself is shot in the hand. Still, he manages to escape. 
next thing you know, I hear sirens. And police were out there, and cameras, news people, reporters. Yarborough is arrested at the scene, but the FBI has no idea where Matthews has gone. And something he's left behind suggests authorities had better find him fast. A handwritten threat from Bob Matthews to the government. Surrender now or face daily firefights with the heavily armed warriors of the white American Revolutionary Army. Two days later, Matthews is on a ferry to Whidbey Island just north of Seattle, where he writes a formal declaration of war, confirming his intent to do battle. He summons Bruce Pierce and others to his hideout. I signed, and I'm proud that I did sign. But it was more of a formality in my eyes. We declare ourselves to be in a full and unrelenting state of war. A state of war against the United States government. That nothing has changed. I still feel the same way. After Pierce leaves the island, Matthews decides to go public with a letter to the media. Included in it, a warning for the traitor in room 14, Tom Martinez. We will find him, Matthews writes, and when we do, we will remove his head from his body. Matthews also has a message for Richard Kemp the young man who'd once idolized him but had now distanced himself from the group. This, unless you change your mind, will be the last time I ever talk to you. Matthews has an order member phone camp and play this audio tape. I hope that you know what you are doing. They're some of the last recorded words of Bob Matthews. As for myself, I will never submit nor surrender my conscience is clear. I think his last words were, you guys are going to have to live with that. Goodbye, Kinsman. At dawn on December 7th, the enemy Matthews hated so much finally catches up with him. Another informant who has never been identified has tipped off the FBI, and more than 75 elite federal agents have descended on Whidbey Island including FBI investigator Wayne Manis. I remember thinking that finally, after all this work, I'm going to come face to face with Bob Matthews. Within hours, other order members on the island give up without a fight, but not their leader. We'll continue to negotiate with the uh, subject or subjects in the house as of about five minutes ago. Over the next 32 hours, the FBI tries to get Matthews to surrender. Ron Edwards from the county sheriff's office listens to the bizarre negotiations. One of the things that, that he wanted was that all of the blacks be put on boats and shipped back to Africa. By the next afternoon, Matthews is refusing to talk anymore. Five SWAT team officers storm into the house, only to find him barricaded on the second floor. When Matthews opens fire with an assault rifle, Manus and Edwards are right outside. I saw bullets splattering through the wall directly over my head. The roar of the weapon that Matthews was using was, it, it was unbelievable. Well, I've been involved in gun battles during my tenure in the FBI, but never anything like this. After 10 minutes, the SWAT team is ordered back. A second gun battle erupts that night when a helicopter is called in. And then there was silence. A decision is made. Flares will be used to light up the ground floor. A fire begins, then spreads. And the whole time the house was burning, he was still firing. Uh, he wouldn't give up. The leader of the order never emerges from his safe house. I will never submit, nor surrender. Goodbye, kinsman. Bob Matthews' war with the government has finally come to an end. I feel quite certain that um, he succumbed to the, uh, the heat smoke. One by one, the order members hear the news. The next morning, one body was found in the smoking rubble. I felt it was, it was my fault that he was dead. And I thought of him burning in fire. Was he thinking of me? Was he blaming me? Was he cursing me? Somehow I couldn't even bring myself to cry when it happened. Because I knew that Bob was the catalyst for everything that was happening and that maybe it could be over once and for all now. Try to identify where the computers are. It wasn't over for Bruce Pierce. In this audio tape made after Matthew's death,
he seems to be planning more terrorist attacks. Use time devices in the water supply uh, to contaminate the water of a major city. Were you seriously, Bruce, considering poisoning a water supply? Actually, at that time, I can't say whether I was serious or not serious. But, theoretically speaking, when one is at war, one has to consider such things, unfortunately. Armed with an arsenal of weapons, Pierce and a handful of others take off across the country, vowing to carry on Bob Matthews' revolution. What happened to the men who escaped? Did the FBI succeed in tracking them all down? Some surprising developments when we return. We capture most of the remaining members of the order. In that time, a hardcore group of them continued to plan an attack on the Los Angeles water supply. Another member killed a state trooper. But almost a year after Bob Matthews' death, his followers went on trial in Seattle on federal conspiracy and racketeering charges. In September 1985, authorities stood guard outside the Seattle Federal Courthouse with submachine guns. Inside, 10 order members sat behind two tables. Their chairs literally bolted to the floor. U.S. Marshals were so concerned they'd use them as weapons. The defendants sat here for 16 weeks and listened to the testimony against them. The most damning came from men who had once sworn total loyalty to their comrades. Among them, Tony Walsh, Bob Matthews' best friend, who broke down as he testified. Tom Martinez, the FBI informant who led the authorities to Matthews. And Denver Parmenter, who once belonged to the order's inner circle and renounced everything to become the government's star witness. It was a logical thing to do. I mean, do I... How can you go on and be a martyr when you don't believe in it anymore? Ten remained silent and were convicted including Randy Dewey, who received 100 years. Richard Kemp, who once called Bob Matthews his mentor. Kemp was sentenced to 60 years. And Bruce Pierce, for his role in the order's crimes, including the murder of Alan Berg, he eventually was sentenced to 252 years. So essentially, you gave your life for this. Yes. And that's OK. In the end, we're going to win. Only a quarter of the four million stolen dollars was ever recovered. The rest was reportedly distributed among the radical right. You don't have it in you to be strong, to be brave, to stand up for your folk and your people and to act like a white person, do you? Yes. The you same won. faces and voices of hate that once inspired Bob Matthews are still out there, inspiring a growing extremist fringe. They did destroy the order, but they didn't destroy the movement. Um, it still exists. The proof for Denver Parmenter came just five months ago. The Oklahoma bombing didn't surprise me. You know, people seem so shocked that it was domestic terrorism. I don't know why. I mean, that's what we did. Timothy McVeigh, accused of the Oklahoma City bombing, is reported to have studied the order and, like Bob Matthews, passed out copies of the Turner Diaries, the extremist handbook for the violent overthrow of the federal government. The day it happened, first thing I thought of was that damn book, The Turner Diaries. And that book has got a part in there about where they take a rider truck and put it in the, bo in the bottom of the federal building. The bomb in Oklahoma City was a mixture of fuel oil and fertilizer and was detonated shortly after 9 a.m., just like in the Turner Diaries. And even though the book reads like some, some sick science fiction, it's people that take it seriously. This is going to happen again. It doesn't take 20 people to plane a bomb. One person takes, and you're going to see another order. You mark my words. And although we may have lost, temporarily lost a battle, we haven't lost the war. Time is on our side. To the extreme right, Bob Matthews is a martyr, but he has left another legacy. His son, Clinton, is now 14 and already active in the movement for which his father lived and died. In the two years since we first broadcast this story, a family member tells us Clinton Matthews has left the movement his father died for. As for the men you met tonight who testified against their former comrades, they have renounced their racist beliefs. Most served short prison terms and went on to establish